and gentlemen, welcome to the Connect Conference 2021 Day 4, brought to you by Huawei. Good day everyone and thank you for joining us today at the Connect Conference 2021 on this virtual platform. Um, it's a great honor for me this morning to introduce Claudio Lugari from Huawei Technologies um, into this next session. Um, Claudio has been with um, Huawei for um, a couple of years now, and um, today he's going to be speaking on fiber transport technologies and solutions from the access to the core. Um, so Claudio has joined Huawei already in 2015 um, in the role of DWDM Solution Sales Manager, um, and is based in the beautiful Milan in Italy. His main responsibility is to develop and promote Huawei optical transport strategies and solutions um, on a global scale. Um, he started his career as a technical manager for Marconi Telecommunications um, and then joined Ericsson, where he was part of the optical transport product management team for 10 years. He then joined um, as technical coordinator to SDN product development unit um, in Ericsson AB. And finally, then, uh, as mentioned, joined Huawei in 2015. Uh, Claudio, it's a great pleasure for, uh, for the Digital Council to have you join us today. Um, we're really excited about the phenomenal content that Huawei has uh, shared with our members um, and the greater industry over the last couple of days. And we're very much looking forward to this session as well. I will start highlighting what are the most important technologies, uh, let's say, uh, that are used today in order uh, to uh, improve uh, um, fiber optical transport. And these are DWDM, dense wavelength division multiplexing, in order to fill uh, the couple of fiber with multiple wavelength and so increase the data that are transported across the fiber. And the other very important technology is uh, optical transport network, which is an industry protocol, uh, very robust that has been used uh, uh, within the last 20 years, according to ITUT G709 standard. And this is exactly, let's say, called the optical layer. So if WDM can be considered the layer zero, uh, OTN can be considered the layer one. And it is used in order to, to fill efficiently the wavelength uh, with uh, optical containers uh, and then uh, uh, separate uh, the services and grant the transparency, uh, mm, let's say keep the characteristic of the original services thanks to the OTM. So today we will talk about the development that we have seen uh, across WDM and OTM network for the uh, optical fiber transport. And let me say, that uh, Huawei is definitely a leader in this market. Uh, in the last uh, uh, 10 years, uh, uh, Huawei has dominated this, uh, this uh, 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 optical fiber transport, uh, and it is a pretty troubled market because uh, we have seen a lot of players that have disappeared. Uh, I don't say this, uh, uh, let's say, to show off. I say this because at the base of this uh, leadership, there is definitely the innovation. So Huawei has uh, kept investing in the innovation in the optical fiber transport. And as you may see, uh, starting from the 90s, we have definitely improved uh, the transport. And we will see uh, which are the pillars uh, of it and uh, in which sense uh, we feel we have improved this kind of uh, development. So let me mention uh, in 2012, uh, the single slot one terabit platform. In uh, 2018, uh, the single carrier 400 gigabit in commercial use. Uh, and now there is a lot of talking about 400 gigabit, but let's not forget that uh, uh, the state of the art uh, of the optical transport right now for the single wavelength is definitely 800 gigabit. And uh, we have already trialed and shown and we have commercially available the single carrier 800 gigabit. Uh, another very important highlight, and we will see across my speech why, it's uh, the industry for super C band and uh, the fact that uh, this is uh, bound to uh, the possibilities that fiber offers uh, uh, across uh, uh, the telecommunication industry. Let me also highlight the requirements of the optical transmission network. So the bandwidth is a traditional challenge with which we have coped for the last 20 years. So uh, even now, there are networks uh, uh, 
uh, telco hyperscalers that are growing, uh, uh, let's say, doubling the bandwidth requirement every year. These are quite extreme cases, uh, and this has been mainly driven by the video requirement. But it's very important to highlight this because bandwidth still uh, is the central challenge that we have to cope with uh, in uh, the fiber optical transport. And uh, uh, it's even more uh, uh, pushy if we think about uh, the, the next revolution that will happen uh, in, uh, in the ICT industries like the 5G or uh, uh, the cloudification of the services uh, and uh, the, the fact that the enterprises will be pushed in order to offer best quality services and not any more best, best uh, um, let's say, um, best effort services. Uh, so bandwidth can be considered the central KPI, key performance indicator, but not just bandwidth. Uh, other uh, parameters uh, have become more and more uh, important. Uh, one uh, above all, uh, the latency. So with these best quality services, we need uh, to control uh, tightly the latency. And there are a lot of methods to do it that we will touch them. Uh, but not just latency, security, reliability. So availability of the services and availability of the network uh, is very important. Uh, then uh, it comes to provide uh, a very flexible network in many senses, both hardware and software, and in order uh, uh, to provide uh, uh, certain levels of these KPIs uh, in a non-demand way. And this, uh, uh, this is uh, very complex uh, because uh, the optical transport network, uh, as it has developed, uh, was quite rigid. So nowadays we are pushed in order to flexibilize and to make this network uh, more agile. Last but not least, uh, we need to introduce intelligence, which means uh, automation, which means the possibility to use up in the upper layers uh, and uh, exactly to give to the end user the possibility uh, to, to tailor its demand and uh, uh, to find it fulfilled across the network. That is why we, uh, we consider an intelligent optics network, uh, a network that uh, fulfills this requirement of ultra bandwidth, uh, agility, intelligence, uh, and uh, this goes from the access uh, to the core. So the point is to build uh, a very uh, flexible network uh, uh, with advanced technologies. And these technologies, uh, uh, the, the pillars that uh, we consider for the optical transport network uh, are definitely uh, the evolution of the speeds that we offer uh, over the fiber. So uh, the, the single wavelength capacity, but not just the single wavelength capacity, also the overall spectrum that we have available over the fiber. Fiber is a super important asset. The more data we can transmit efficiently over the fiber, the more efficient uh, will be uh, the network. Then we have, uh, uh, let's say, the, the fact that we need uh, to uh, improve the sites. And uh, uh, this means uh, uh, to reduce the capex for sure, but also uh, uh, to squeeze the technologies because uh, there are a lot of uh, data that must be transported and uh, a lot of protocols uh, uh, in uh, in the access of the network so if you if we think that we have uh, fixed broadband mobile broadband enterprise requirement uh, that there is still sth around there ethernet uh, uh, scon ficon so a lot of different signals that must be transported in an efficient way so the point is uh, to transport them uh, reducing the cost per bit uh, we have to improve the architecture itself. So uh, the more meshed will be the network, the better will be the latency because we have a shorter connection across the fiber, which is the main contributor over the latency. We have not to forget that. And then we need uh, uh, exactly to meet uh, the new requirement of services. I was mentioning the fact uh, that uh, uh, we are now in a world where uh, uh, best quality services are very important. Uh, uh, we have seen what happened with the OTTs and the fact, that, and uh, let me mention that uh, if you wait, uh, uh, let's say, a few seconds to see your video, I will not mention what it is, but it's very clear what I refer to, uh, then we prob you will probably drop and we you will complain uh, with your uh, uh, provider uh, because this is what happens. So uh, end users uh, uh, really want the quality. And it's very important the fiber is uh, fundamental uh, in order to offer uh, it to the end users. Uh, last but not least, uh, a new smart operational maintenance uh, with very reliable protocols in terms of protection. So because the availability, as I was uh, mention mentioning, it's very important uh, to have a network which is uh, very solid, very robust, the services must not, not drop down, and, and so the downtime of the network must be very low. And uh, the other point is automation, which, is, uh, which has been mentioned uh, a lot of time, and we need to make our network more automatic in order to reduce uh, the OPEX, uh, but also to meet the requirement that I was mentioning. So let, let me go on uh, with 
the first pillar I was uh, highlighting, the ultra bandwidth. And let me mention that this goes in two directions for uh, WDM and, uh, and uh, OTM. So uh, in order to extend the bandwidth transmitted over the, over the fiber, uh, which traditionally has been done over the C-band, uh, we have uh, uh, mainly two ways. One is to increase the single wavelength capacity, and the other one is to extend the spectrum over which we transmit these wavelengths. Uh, so, uh, up to two years ago, the main line rate uh, for the single wavelength capacity was 100 gigabit, uh, and the, the, the specific modulation in order to cope with large distances was QPSK, and the, 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 the main bandwidth used was the C-band, so we could send 100 gigabit into 50 gigahertz uh, into the fixed grid uh, across 4 terahertz of C-band. Uh, but now this, has, this uh, has evolved, and there are a lot of advances in this sense, uh, as you may see, uh, because we have introduced new line rates for the single wavelength capacities, and uh, we have uh, uh, a lot of modulations in order to transmit them across the network. So 200 gigabit, 400 gigabit, 600 gigabit, 800 gigabit, which is the state of the art. But obviously there is a, a, a trade-off, so we cannot transmit uh, uh, across uh, thousands of kilometers an 800 gigabit uh, compared to 100 gigabit QPSK, uh, because there are impairments, uh, uh, because uh, let's say obviously we need uh, to take into account uh, that uh, uh, we need another modulation uh, and there are a lot of technical parameters that affect the signals. Uh, furthermore, we need to consider also that uh, uh, with the unextended bandwidth, uh, we will have also to improve uh, the, uh, the, the, the hardware parts uh, like optical line amplifiers, uh, wavelength selective switches by which uh, the WDM network uh, is, uh, um, is built. Uh, let's uh, uh, let's remember mind that WDM networks started to be point-to-point uh, -point connectivity from terminal to terminal, then fixed optical drop multiplexer were introduced, uh, then uh, uh, reconfigurable drop optical drop multiplexers in order to make the network more meshed and in order to grant more connectivity. And now we faced a lot of different technologies in order to introduce uh, arrow ADMs, uh, and uh, we think we have really reached uh, a very good point in doing that with very advanced uh, uh, architectural solutions. And I will describe them for you. So uh, as I was mentioning two years ago, there was the replacement uh, of the King 100 gigabit line rate over the WDM network on the line side with the 200 gigabit. And here, let me mention that Huawei has a very efficient solution because uh, we were able uh, to, to offer the 200 gigabit into 50 gigahertz. So into the same grid, uh, into the same, uh, let's say, spectrum space by which 100 gigabit is transmitting. So we have definitely doubled the bandwidth and doubled the spectral efficiency. So we have a pluggable 200 gigabit pluggable CFP2, uh, and we are uh, uh, the main provider offering 200 gigabit across the world. We have improved the modulation and uh, all the technical aspects uh, by which the 200 gigabit is transmitted, and we can uh, transmit it across a distance which is beyond 1,000 kilometers. I will not specify. Uh, the distance because it really depends on the fiber parameters. But it's very important because uh, uh, on one side, uh, uh, this kind of solution could delay uh, the, the movement from replace the infrastructure from flex grid, from fixed grid to flex grid. Uh, even if we have totally solutions for the flex grid, which is necessary when you go uh, to the beyond the 100 gigabit or 200 gigabit signals, uh, so uh, you cannot uh, efficiently fit uh, 400 gigabit, 600 gigabit, 800 gigabit into 50 gigahertz, but uh, you would probably need 75 gigahertz or even 100 gigahertz, depending on the distances you have to cross. So, and this is one solution. Obviously, uh, we also have, uh, uh, let's say, non pluggables in order to cope with larger distances, but this is just to highlight one of the very important aspects. So, to squeeze uh, the, the hardware in order to uh, occupy less space uh, into the central office and in order to reduce the power consumption. And this solution could reduce the power consumption of 60% increase the, the distance uh, of transmission uh, and then offer a, a, a super solid alternative compared to the 100 gigabit and even comparable. 
But then also, uh, let's say, mentioning the fact that we have an available uh, uh, state of the art solution for the 800 gigabit, uh, we have already tried it across uh, uh, more than 1000 kilometers. We have fully recognized by uh, international analysts. And in this case, uh, even if this solution is not obviously yet uh, uh, available on a plug, but it's an MSA multi-source agreement solution. We, we uh, still uh, are dominating the market in this sense. Uh, and the very important point to highlight here is the spectral efficiency. So we could fit uh, the 800 gigabit into 100 uh, gigahertz. Uh, and this is a, a big advantage because, again, uh, if you think that uh, we started from 100 gigabit into 50 gigahertz, then we have uh, four times the data rate into the double of, uh, uh, let's say, spectrum. This is a, a quite relevant achievement. And uh, uh, we are sure that uh, uh, in the next years, uh, this uh, uh, will, uh, uh, will take some importance. Uh, but uh, the, the main point here is that we also think that the 200 gigabit will remain uh, for some period uh, the, the, the most important line, line rate for WDM, uh, because it really meets a lot of requirements uh, in the trade-off uh, in between the, the, the bandwidth available over the fiber uh, and uh, uh, the distance uh, that it can cover. Today, we are closer to the theoretical limit than ever before. But the real challenge still lies in live networks. You can easily transmit a 200 g for over 2,000 kilometers in a lab, but it may turn out to be only 500 kilometers in real life. How to bridge this gap from lab to live? This is what really makes sense to all network operators. And this is the most important design principle in Huawei's ODSP, the Optic Stream. Absolutely, DSPs are becoming more and more central and more and more of a key differentiator in optical network systems. The most important technologies used in Optic Stream is channel matched shaping, and we call it CMS. It's a combination of technologies that compensate the different channel impairment in the real life network. In the real networks, the impairments from different sources may have a large impact on the transmission channel. Aged fiber, imperfect filter, or simply a bad weather can lead to a serious system degradation. Channel match shaping is able to sense the impairments and adjust data transmission accordingly. A combination of different shaping techniques are being applied to compensate different sorts of channel penalties, adapt to the shape of a real channel, and improve system performance in real networks. The lag signal used to be like an ice cube, lack of flexibility, hardly adaptive. CMS make it like water flow through a pad. It can feel the shape of the channel, adapt to that, optimize, and automatically, which will save all the troubles. It's not just piling up different techniques. The real trick is how to achieve best performance with least resources. To accomplish this challenge, you need an extensive experience in optical networking and in-depth knowledge of uh, physics of lights. And that's what we are good at. And the other point I was highlighting, so taking into account, uh, as I was mentioning, that uh, technology can make a difference, uh, uh, not just uh, increasing the single wavelength capacity through advanced technologies, but also with the same uh, advanced technologies to increase the overall spectrum uh, by which we transmit uh, over the optical network. And here, traditionally, as I was saying, we move from the C-band uh, uh, which is uh, uh, which accounts for uh, four terahertz, and then if you think about 100 gigabit, 200 gigabit into 50 gigahertz, we have available 80 wavelengths. Uh, uh, we also have the extended C band, which is 4.8 terahertz. But then our proposal, which is really something that distinguishes Huawei from uh, our competitors, is, is the super C band, uh, which accounts for six terahertz. So this means uh, in the compared to a fixed grid that we have the possibility to transmit 120 wavelengths uh, across the fiber. Uh, obviously, uh, these, uh, uh, the, the fixed grid is just a reference because we need to think beyond 200 gigabit into the 50 gigahertz that we are in a flex grid world. Uh, and then we had to improve uh, all, uh, all the parts, or all the, uh, let's say, uh, components of our optical network in order to take into account this bandwidth. And we did it. It's definitely commercial available. So all the tunable lasers, uh, the wavelength selective switches and the optical amplifiers are able to transmit over the super C band. And this also 
So gives the possibility, and that's why we you, you see, uh, let's say, uh, sometimes 48 terabit uh, of uh, overall uh, total data or 88 terabit, uh, because we have uh, a way in order to smoothly pass uh, from uh, the super C bandwidth to the super C plus super L bandwidth. So uh, we have taken into account also the L band, uh, the evolution toward the L band that will be definitely important uh, probably in the next five uh, from from five to ten years in order to further increase the bandwidth transmitted over the fiber. OK, my PC is not uh, responding anymore. And then we move uh, to the second pillar of our proposal, which is an agile network. And so how to improve also the, the sites uh, uh, relevant to the optical transport network. And here uh, it's very important uh, uh, to uh, um, to improve uh, uh, both the optical layers, uh, so to implement uh, the, the best uh, uh, RODAM technologies, reconfigurable optical drop multiplexers, uh, giving them the possibility to work in a full CDCG architecture, so colorless, directionless, contentionless, uh, gridless, uh, which, is the which are the most advanced technologies in order to make the optical network, so the WDM network, the, the more flexible than possible. But then there is also the electrical layer, so we need to squeeze uh, uh, different technologies Technologies for a universal transport, and we need to use the OTN optical transport network in the best possible way to efficiently feed the wavelengths and reduce the cost per bit associated to our network. And uh, in this sense, uh, there is another uh, very strong uh, uh, distinguisher of Huawei offerings because Huawei uh, three years ago launched uh, the first uh, uh, optical backplane equipment, the optical cross connect with the P32 equipment. So we have embedded, uh, uh, let's say, an optical backplane uh, and we have squeezed the functionalities in order to build uh, a CDCG RODAM network. Uh, and so in the traditional architecture, you have uh, uh, five to seven boards in order to provide a DWDM uh, uh, directions uh, in a mesh network. Uh, now with the optical cross connect, uh, we have improved the connectivity over a single uh, equipment and we can squeeze, for example, nine WDM directions from nine subrecs into one uh, subrec, which is the P32, uh, which was the first released equipment as optical cross connect uh, or the P32 seed, which is the compact version. And uh, these also, uh, so, uh, we have reduced a lot uh, the, the fiber us usage uh, uh, for uh, this kind of node, uh, which is very complex, so it's very important uh, uh, to keep track of these. Uh, we have reduced the footprint, uh, the power consumption, beca because this is a full optical equipment, and we have strongly reduced the complexity of the operation and maintenance. So we can, uh, let's say, have an automatic commissioning in half an hour instead of hours uh, uh, in order to commission this kind of node. And then let me launch another uh, another video in order to show you uh, the, the technologies that are behind this uh, extremely important solution for Huawei. Huawei's OXC system involves several key technologies. The first one is the all optical backplane. We remove the outer jacket of the traditional fiber and then knit the fiber silk into a nanopolymer film using a customized machine. This can support sub-micron level precision. After knitting, the machine will coat the film with an organic gel to fix the fiber with ultraviolet light exposure and solidification. Finally, an all-optical backplane with more than 1,000 fibers is successfully produced, which can now be installed in the system. Each board can connect to the backplane through Huawei's innovative optical connector, which features a two-level dust-proof design to prevent dust from affecting the optical signal. A complete system includes line cards, all optical backplane, and tributary cards. For each optical direction, only one line card in one slot is needed. Elcus is embedded in the line card for optical switching. This is the second key technology. Wavelengths enter the Elcus module from the optical connector in the line card and pass through an array of optical lenses to perform beam shaping. Wavelength will be separated by an optical grating and then arrive at the Elcus chipset. With phase control technology, Elcus implements space routing to achieve 32 potential directions and is able to redirect light as required. Huawei's self-developed Elcus chip features a 4K resolution, which is much higher than other vendors. Moreover, we have innovatively optimized the switching algorithms from 1D to 2D, which can achieve more wavelengths and many more directions. 
OXC supports wavelength detection for digital O&M. This is the third key technology. With OFDM overhead modulation, a wavelength with a signal label travels through the port and splits 1% of the light for signal label detection. The remaining 99% of the light will be transmitted if found to be correct. OFDM pilot tone and high precision wavelength monitoring enable the visualization of fiber quality, wavelength resources, and overall performance of the system. This will greatly improve the efficiency of O&M. OXC simplifies WDM with zero fire connection, improves the efficiency of operation and maintenance, saves 90% of site space, reduces power consumption by 60%, and achieves a faster time to market. Let's see if the audio will keep. So, and another very important uh, point, as I was mentioning at the beginning of this section, is to improve the electrical uh, uh, side of the network. And uh, we have done this with uh, multiple equipment. Let me just uh, uh, highlight here the, the platform, the OSN IT under the M platform, and in, in particular the M24 where we have squeezed uh, uh, different technologies like uh, uh, Ethernet aggregation, layer 2 aggregation, SDA, OTN switching and transport, PDH, and uh, uh, a set of uh, optical and exponder cars. So with this equipment, we really uh, mean to, to, to arrive at the uh, um, universal transport, uh, increasing the capacity because this equipment has an overall uh, equivalent capacity which can reach up to 10 terabit. It has 24 for slots, uh, two sides of slot, uh, which are flexible and interchangeable, and uh, we can use the uh, cards from multiple uh, uh, equipment. So these are common cards with other uh, equipment uh, of uh, our families. And uh, uh, we have cards that can assess the optical switching matrix, but can also be used uh, as max ponders or transponders uh, in a flexible way. Uh, another very important point, we have squeezed the functionalities uh, uh, for, uh, uh, let's say, the optical side that can be used over this equipment uh, uh, into a single board. So we have uh, one single board which, which can cope with one WDM direction. The other very important uh, point is uh, uh, Edge OTN. So uh, with Edge OTN, uh, we have reduced the size of the equipment, WDM and OTN equipment, uh, in order to make a proposal and to extend OTN up to the edge of the network. And again, uh, with this kind of solution, uh, we can add the WDM functionalities even to the gray rings uh, like SDH rings or IPNR rings, uh, which are at the access of the network. Here we have a distributed X plus Y architecture, meaning that we don't need an optical switching metric, so we could reduce uh, the, 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 the price of the solution, uh, the, the, the space uh, occupation of this solution, which is obviously uh, for uh, outdoor installation. And uh, we can provide uh, a ring of up to 40 wavelengths uh, with uh, 200 gigabit line rates, uh, and uh, uh, these, uh, uh, thanks to the Y ponder solution, uh, can access the backplane of the equipment, but also uh, the, the cards can be used as max ponders. And obviously, on this kind of solution, uh, which is done exactly in order to use the great capacity of the WDM on DOTN uh, into the access, and that can be smoothly installed, uh, uh, for example, introducing first the optical layer and then adding uh, the line cards and the, the client cards in order to introduce the services. Uh, we are have integrated all the latest uh, uh, pluggables so like 10 gigabit, uh, 25 gigabit, and 50 gigabit. We because uh, definitely into the access we are going uh, uh, to use these kind of pluggables uh, and associated them uh, to the great capacities of transport over fiber provided by OTN and WDM. But uh, the point is also to increase the capacities uh, that uh, we can provide uh, uh, over the networks thanks to the technology. So Huawei is also investing a lot in order to improve OTN technologies. And we are working inside the standards uh, with our solution, which is called Liquid OTN. And Liquid OTN, uh, because at the beginning of this speech, I mentioned how robust and very important is OTN technologies for the optical uh, transport networks. That is true. Uh, but the point is that OTN has some limitations. The bigger one, the biggest one is the granularity. So the smaller container is uh, an audio zero, which fits uh, the, the 
gigabit Ethernet transmission, 1.25 gigabit. But uh, we have improved uh, the OTN technology in order to transport even smaller rates, uh, introducing a new container, the optical service unit, uh, and so replacing uh, the, the, the traditional containers of the OTN with this optical service unit, uh, which is much more flexible. And so we can transmit, uh, let's say, client rates from 2 megabit up to 100 gigabit, and uh, the granularity and the flexibility of this transmission is much higher. So we can really fit uh, any requirements in self more client rates starting from uh, the two megabit, reducing uh, in the same uh, uh, at the same time the power consumption associated to the technology and the latency because we have uh, improved uh, the mapping methods uh, of the traditional OTN. So this is another great achievement that Huawei has proposed for the optical transport network. And let me uh, just show you the last video of my of my presentation, and then I will enter in the last part of my of my speech. Generation OTN premium private line technology, Liquid OTN will provide low latency, 100-fold connections, and hitless bandwidth adjustment capabilities, enabling quality experience for a wide variety of industries. Banks are the financial backbone of a country. As the finance industry becomes more informatized, ATMs and VTMs are being widely deployed. Most bank branches have scaled rates from 10 megabits per second to 50 megabits per second. Highly reliable and ubiquitous connections become the basic requirements of banks' digital transformation. The COVID-19 pandemic is straining global medical resources and forces the healthcare industry to respond through technology. The 3D CT image of one patient may have a data volume of gigabits. In emergency remote consultation, the high bandwidth of private lines needs to be temporarily and losslessly adjusted for real-time transmission of data at gigabit speeds. Flexible and adjustable high bandwidth has become the core requirement of the healthcare industry. In 2012, BATS went public with an opening price of 15.25 US dollars, but this plummeted to 0.04 cents within just 900 milliseconds. A total of 176 high frequency transactions occurred during this period. Latency is life or death for the stock market. The next generation OTN solution, Liquid OTN, is developed to address this challenge. Huawei has led the development of optical networks in the past 20 years. And then we enter in the last part, which is smart operational maintenance. And here we highlight uh, how important it is uh, uh, to provide an upper layer. So, and this upper layer, according to the software defined networking architecture, is IMA. SNC for Huawei Network Cloud Engine, which is a full life cycle network management controller and analyzer, uh, and which has a lot of use cases in order uh, uh, to provide service automation, uh, maintenance automation, and resource automation, and then in order to squeeze uh, uh, the uh, the time to market for the new dev services from month to days, uh, in increase the efficiency uh, of more than 30% and the revenues associated to the services of more than 20%. And, and, and NCT, and then we'll see also Azona have a large commercial applications. Here are some use cases. Uh, let me highlight that the NC can provide. So we do, we have not just upgraded the hardware, uh, but we have upgraded also the upper layer and uh, provided it with a lot of use cases in order to make the network more automatic, in order to visualize uh, the services, the service level agreements, uh, in order to visualize and to control and monitor the latency, the bandwidth, uh, in order to quickly install the ser service premise is uh, uh, the uh, customer premises equipment uh, and having them operational uh, in just one visit, one engineer visit, and in order to really control the network with full simulation and performance visualization. And this brings uh, to the way to protect uh, the network, uh, and we think that uh, Azon uh, uh, automatically switch optical network uh, uh, enables uh, the highest level of availability and so to reduce the downtime of the network. Here we see the different si signals, uh, uh, different services according uh, to their prices, according to their needs, uh, to their uh, uh, level uh, uh, of importance. They can, pro they can be protected uh, uh, in a less or more efficient way and cope with multiple failures 
failures uh, uh, across the fiber network. So we have uh, uh, the, the permanent diamond level, which can really protect against uh, any number of uh, fiber failures across the network. And we have improved uh, the ASON, uh, increasing uh, the, uh, the domain uh, the network domain uh, where it can be applied, the number of equipment supporting it, introducing all the latest technologies and squeezing the time at both electrical and optical layer. Last point uh, is that we see how important uh, are the best quality services uh, for the enterprises. We have seen uh, uh, enterprise, uh, uh, the, the enterprises asking for premium services uh, as uh, it was done in the financial industry, as it was done uh, by governmental institution. We think we can make a perfect or, uh, offering uh, uh, to these enterprises uh, through OTN and WDM, uh, differentiating the offer of the services uh, through bandwidth on demand, latency, time to market of the new services and availability. Thank you so much for listening and I hope you enjoyed my speech. Thank you Claudio. Um, it's always amazing for me because you know it doesn't matter how long I am in the sector you know I still am amazed by um, some of the, the, the speeds that we can achieve and um, I'm still always like so excited about the progress that we're making in technology and um, it must be phenomenal you know I'm sort of still sitting on the on the outside it must be phenomenal for somebody like you to be um, you know part of a team where you get to witness firsthand some of the the progress that's being made in um, in connectivity and yeah it's um, like it's like a long yeah, way. It, it's like to to I mean, uh, to be in an alien world, because when I started, all of this sounds like a dream, right? If 20 years ago somebody told me you will see this happening, I would have said, uh, Bullsh bullshit, it's, it's impossible. I can imagine. I 100% I believe you because I'm still like, I'm like blown away by um, the capabilities. And I think one of the, the big things, you know, although you're on the technical side and you're seeing it, you know, from that um, that sort of, you know, side to um, progress, you know, the, the technical aspects of connectivity for me and, and in my real life and my everyday job, I see the opportunities and the potential of what this could mean for the world and especially for developing countries that really need to leverage digital technologies to, um, to promote themselves and to, you know, create jobs um, and to grow their economies. Um, and certainly for the Digital Council, um, the, the technology arena is one of those areas where we really believe that we can scale and you know, move the needle, uh, create jobs. Um, if we can get African governments to buy into um, you know, the opportunities that uh, connectivity will produce for Africa. But, well, um, let's, but let's think what uh, connectivity did for Europe. I mean, in this pandemic, uh, it was possible to cope with the pandemic just uh, thanks to the the connectivity provided by the telecommunication. Imagine uh, if this uh, happened uh, 30 years ago where people had really no connectivity at all at home. I, I kept working from home. My colleagues did it in a very efficient way and we could even meet customers uh, online and we still are. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, I can't agree with you more. Um, for me, the, the pandemic, as, as terrible as it was, was also this thing that shook people awake and said, you know, this is... This is now, this is it. This is the fourth industrial revolution. And there's a train that's going and it's leaving the station. And either you're going to be on it, but it's going, or you're going to be left behind. So um, so congratulations to Awawi, to you and your team for the phenomenal work that you guys are doing. Um, you know, and um, then also thank you very much to Awawi for always supporting our work as the Digital Council and you know, throwing their weight behind our conversations and, and some of the work that we do. And thank you, Claudio. I know you're a very busy man. Thank you very much for your time. Um, you, um, yeah, you um, will hold it a, a little bit against you that you um, that you work from such a beautiful place in Italy um, on the coast. But um, but you still thank you very much for your time, and um, we really appreciate it. Ladies and gentlemen, we trust you enjoyed the session. Thank you to all our sponsors and partners for helping us bring this event to you. Please click on the next link to join the following session.